Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, Laura, for asking me to speak. You know, the first thing that comes to mind is is fear. I'm like, I don't want to do that. There are a thousand excuses I can make up to not do that. But it's always being, you know, honest, open-minded, and willing in this program. That's that's really led to a lot of success, and or at least personal success. And anyway, it's good to be among all of you tonight. Um, I'm an alcoholic and an addict, and but most people call me Christina. <laughs> and uh, my sobriety date is January 20th of 2020. So I just uh, just got about like 25 months and change. Um, but really, I'm just, I'm just here 24 hours, just like the rest of us. And um, so I just briefly wanted to touch on like the whole, like how it was, what it was like, how it's now, um, because I think it gives some context to I'm really wanting to talk about uh, step one and four letter words. So, um, so how it was, was um, really mostly an unremarkable and unmemorable passage in life and the reason I say unmemorable is because I don't remember a lot of it not as much as I feel like I should be accountable for and I still kind of wrestle with that today it really disturbs me um what it was like um what I can gather and like what it was is that it was a wildly stressful and deadly time in my life um where not only myself, but others were either placed in direct harm and affected. And for any of us to think that we do this alone in, in recovery or that we did it alone in injuring ourselves is false. Like we do this together um, now, now being in recovery. And I, that, I, I cling to that a lot. Um, anyhow, uh, trying to think this was a time where I felt like life was really railing at me like everything was anyone else but my my fault and I railed back at life um probably with about the same amount of success as like one tries to do like you know railing at the ocean or trying to command the tides and or yeah I'm not god so yeah I failed miserably and like fell on my face countless number of times um so which brings me to fair like thinking about fair because I have been it's come up a lot in my life as and in tandem so has step one um I'm still working the end of the steps but step one is still really important to me um and I, I know to many of us, um, because fair is, you know, it's another four letter word. I remember reading about that one time. There's a lot of four letter words that I think we all know that we say in haste, but being human, I suppose we carry a sense of justice and being wronged in so many ways, so many times throughout the day, throughout the minutes, throughout, you know, just all these things in our lives. And, um, really it's it's one of those things that's you know when nothing feels fair that's really deadly to us who exist in these rooms and are trying to either find recovery or stay in recovery um and truly being with fair (laughs) comes also fear another four-letter word which renders me powerless like every time or you know irritable restless and discontent and I can't survive in that state for very long it's it's not sustainable whatsoever not in any area of my life and it really has been like one of those things that like being in sobriety is like oh it's not a little you know sunshine and roses afterwards you get to deal with all the feelings all the anguish all the you know everything that comes along with still feeling unfair and still being in fear but there's you know this cognizance now like this pause I think a lot of people talk about um where 
even with like needing that sense of justice or this hasn't been fair um the, in the context of powerlessness and like in step one and to me that's fertile ground for unmanageability and without a god of my understanding and the 12 steps like this program um I, i'll burn down everything in my past and so in some sense of the word like this program saved my life um my higher power has saved my life and all of you have and i i appreciate being able to be among every single one of you tonight um and so again while fair is a four-letter word so is hope and so is love and life and you know right now like this week has been kind of a doozy like i have a partner who has just finally come to terms with the fact that he's an alcoholic and i you would think that there would be like success or like victory over that feeling but it's just it's hard it's just hard um i believe that's another four letter word and then also um my daughter's uh caregiver of the last couple years we just found out that she has an inoperable brain tumor and that's hard too you know but it's like being in sobriety like i couldn't move through these feelings i couldn't move through that fear or anything else that gets tossed my way so i can really only speak from my experience that step uh, that like with step 1 where there's all these things like oh it's the only one you have to do right or it's you know there's so many things about step 1 or right something that's been really important to me is that it wasn't the damning reckoning that i once saw it as that i have to say this about myself it's about starting a new maybe once maybe a thousand times for you or me or anybody else in these rooms but it's still an irrevocable attempt to live and we are all i think out that you know no matter where we've come from or what we've done you know how far down the scale um and you know it really has it's it, it's been impressed upon me that healing from the past either wasn't an option or something that i wasn't deserving of or worth or that it was worth pursuing um but step 1 seems to be less of getting called out in shame and more of an acknowledgement that life with alcohol in its various forms will continuously render me powerless and and kill me so i don't know it's just a little thing that i was thinking on um how am i doing on time two minutes okay good yeah, i don't have a lot to say so i'll wrap, I'll wrap up and be like 20 seconds um let's see oh just the last thing about step 1 just that it's you know a step of it of acknowledgement not just it it's for us you know it's for us and you know all the other steps where we're stating and digging and acknowledging to other thing uh, other people like it's this chance to to make to do better to be better and um it readies us for life and all that step work ahead <laughs> anyway thanks so much for letting me be a service uh good evening everybody my name is gene and i'm an alcoholic i'm glad to be here and i'm real glad to be sober and uh, christina thank you for your share i could have listened to you for 40 minutes uh, and when you said caregiver you really hit a nerve i think we have something in common and as the my share goes on perhaps we can relate but um man you know uh, each time i share each time i i'm asked to share the first thing that comes to my mind is hell i never wanted to be an alcoholic this is not what i wanted to do stand up and tell people you know my business and realize that i was defeated that i had to throw in the towel that my way didn't work you know i wanted to be that guy you know i grew up you know watching john wayne and davy crockett and those rugged individuals and that's who i wanted to be as a matter of fact uh i was born in new orleans but we came to california when i was 7 because my mother my father's mother who lived here had a had had a heart attack and we came to take care of her 
my parents were fairly young in their early 20s, and uh, they got to California from the little city in Louisiana. And wow, they 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 kind of went wild. What wound up was my grandmother more or less taking care of us. She became the most stable member of our family and the one that really uh, steered me in the right direction. But I remember, you know, coming, going to school, especially, you know, and I, things were great. And I remember when things started to change. Some of you may have been doing the, grew up in the 50s and remember the Walt Disney series and the Davy Crockett's and all that other stuff. And Davy Crockett was my hero. And all I wanted was a Davy Crockett coonskin cap for Christmas. My father bought me that cap. I'd be the happiest guy around. And he was always barking about spending money, so I knew it was going to be a challenge. But lo and behold, Christmas came, and I got my Davy Crockett schoonskin cap. And I put that cap on, put the tail on my shoulder, and ran outside to show my buddies. And across the street was Timmy, this big Irish kid. He had the coonskin cap, the buckskin jacket, the pants with the shaft with the flat on the, and the moccasins and a Mattel rifle. I was devastated. And it was then that I started to notice that I was different. And this was during the 50s and the civil rights movement was going on. And all of a sudden I looked at TV and, you know, it became obvious that, you know, I was a minority and I did not want to be different than my fellows. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be just like everybody else. But society and even TV said, you are a minority. And uh, I grew up with that idea that, you know, I do not want to be different. And uh, I, can, I can read and write just as good as anybody else. I'm, I'm a good at sports. I always make the team. You know, uh, I'm the guy. However, I had some tragedy occur, and, I've, and tragedy has followed me throughout my life. It's just how you deal with it. I found this the, is life. Uh, at 13, my mother was hit by a car and killed. And uh, devastating. I was in junior high school, and it was during the holiday season. And I really didn't want to be pointed. I wanted, I wanted to be different. So I didn't really say, tell anybody about this. Other than there were some adults that knew authority figures and stuff, but my different playmates didn't know. And what I would do, though, in acting out, I'd be around a bunch of friends. They'd be laughing and joking. Next thing you know, I'd start fighting. And they brought this attention to my grandmother who decided, you know, that, you know, you, you, this behavior is out of line. And what I want you to do is look at me as being your mother. And I want you to live this good life I want you to live. Go to finish high school, go to college, and become, become the guy that I know you can be. And I settled in and I started doing what she required Things went great. And then I got right ready to graduate from high school, and my grandmother had a heart attack and died. I decided, what the heck? I remember a family member saying, man, if she hadn't taken on that task of raising her grandson, maybe she wouldn't have had this, she wouldn't have died. And with that, I said, I am not going to stick around here. So within a week or two of me getting my diploma, I joined the Air Force. Little, little did I know I was making a four-year commitment, and I really all of a sudden didn't want to be a soldier. They, they painted a real rosy picture at the recruiter's office, but when I got down to Texas, the basic training, it was like, hey, we're here to make you a killer. Oh, my goodness, I thought this was going to be like the Boy Scouts. And uh, with that, I, I've I did what I had to do, but I did it with, with, with uh, resistance. I really hated authority. And when I found it, when I got some free time after basic training and getting in, and that I, I found some guys that felt the same way I did. And what they did to relieve themselves or to, to show resistance to authority, they would drink, especially on the weekends. And I decided I would drink too, but I would drink with the idea I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get hooked on this stuff. I'm gonna hang out and drink with these guys. When I get out of the Air Force, I'm through. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drink scotch because I hate the taste. 
Little did I know I got hooked on that uh, of scotch. And so I started drinking with the boys. And I remember uh, two years in, I got caught drunk in the barracks. Just, they made a raid for some reason, and I got, was one of the ones that was caught drunk in the barracks. And they decided they was going to make an example of me. They were going to strip me down of rank and, you know, really, you know, let people know what happens to people that drink in the barracks. And for two weeks, they would call me in the office and drill me about my behavior and what I had done. And at the end of the second week, they called me in the office and they all saluted me. And the commander said, you've been given the honor of going to Vietnam. <laughs> and that was the military's way of saying, you know, either you're going to take this assignment or we're going to kick you out. So I went to Vietnam for a year and in Vietnam, it was, it's all, all, all that you hear it is. It's, if you didn't get a chance to go, you don't know what you missed. If you're in the chaos and mayhem and you know what's going on in the, in the Russian border today, I can imagine, you know, and it seems like every 10 years we're in some type of conflict like that, but it's, it's nobody ever wins. It's, it, a lot of death and destruction, a lot of twisted lives. And uh, I remember I remember being there and being really frightened of the, the, the experience. But I remember one day, one evening, I went up on a mountain with these guys with a little, the little lookout where we could go up and drink and you could do drugs, do whatever you want up in this little abandoned lookout station. And we rode up there on a jeep. And uh, as nightfall came, the guy said, we got to get out of here on this Jeep because the road is so bad, we'll go off the cliff. I said, you go on, I'll just walk down. So he left, and I stayed until the, till the, all the fun was gone. The bottles were empty. And I staggered down that, that mountainside. And I knew on the left was, was where you was the drop-off. And as I was going down the mountain, I got confused what was my left and what was my right. And I went to feel for the side of the mountain, and I stepped out in the space. I could feel myself just fall. And I decided, well, I've, I've killed myself. You know, this is it. And when I said that, I hit a sand pile right at the base of that mountain. They had this big, huge mound of sand that they were using to fill roads. I got up from there without a scratch. And I said to myself, you're invincible. You don't need a God or nothing. You know that you're in charge. And I went on and went through Vietnam, came back home, got married, got out of the service and got a job, my dream job working for an airline. And I worked there until I retired. I did 35 years with United Airlines. And, uh, you know, what I did was I had my, my drinking had modified and everything was good. But all of a sudden at the job, I realized I was, uh, I didn't have a, a military serial number. I had a, a United Airlines employee serial number. I was just a number. And what we did was uh, a few friends I found, I found that, that group again, that, that group that, was, that felt like they should be treated better. What we did was we would drink on Friday nights. We'd work like a swing ship, and on Friday nights, we'd stop at the bars and drink. And over a period of time, every night was Friday night. And over a period of time, every day was Monday, those excruciating hangovers. It got to be worse and worse and worse. I just got bad, bad, bad. And uh, I remember, you know, my 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 drinking buddy. That you know, no matter how bad it was, he would he would make any we'd make excuses to one another. And he said, uh, "Hey, man, my my wife is going to divorce me. She says she's tired of me drinking the way I am. You know, I'm married. He's married." 
And instead of me encouraging him to do better, tell me, you know, maybe we should stop and you know, get your life together. I told him, hey, what we're gonna, you're going to do now, you, you're going to be able to get you a bachelor pad. I can come over and we can drink and party and have all the fun we want. Well, hold your head up. And he goes, yeah, you're right. You're right. And then I remember about towards, well, when the divorce hit, I was on vacation. When I came back, they said, your buddy killed himself when he got the divorce papers. I couldn't believe it. You know, he blew his brain. He went, got in his car and blew his brains up. I thought, wow, he, I didn't know it was that bad. I mean, what, what could make him do that? Commit suicide. Oh, my God. Little did I know I was in a depression myself and the drinking wasn't the same. You know, it was, it really got gloomy. And all of a sudden I remember one morning or maybe four o'clock in the morning, this thought came to me, maybe you should kill yourself, G. You know, you're going to, you're, you're, you're going to go on to, you're going to be, this alcohol has got you. Maybe, maybe you should think about that too. And with that idea getting brighter and brighter, I'm getting frightened of myself. All of a sudden, I'm realizing the guy in the mirror is my biggest enemy. It's not society. It's me. I'm going to get, I'm taking myself out. And as I went down that path, I, uh, I find, I remember one, one, one Monday coming into work. And I would, I never, I never did stop working. I, I never let drinking interfere. Drinking never did, fortunately for me, interfere with my job. And the job was such that they, they hid a lot of alcoholism too around me. You could, you could get a little job where you were doing menial jobs, the, 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 the shit, the grunt jobs, the shitty jobs. And, you know, and it, it was okay. You could, you could stay in. So, um. I, re I remember coming in one Monday really feeling bad. And then the, the second day, that Tuesday, I was so bad I couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't drink and I, and I threw up. I walked outside my building and I threw up on the sidewalk. Uh, that Wednesday when I came back in that drive, it had bleached the sidewalk white. All that, uh, whatever I'd regurgitated had, had bleached the sidewalk white. And I said to myself, I quit. I'm not going to do this to myself. This is, this is, this is madness. This is poison. I can't do it anymore. And with that, I stopped. I got a ritual. And that is when I woke up in the morning, I look myself in the mirror and I go, who loves you, baby? You do. Who's the greatest? You are. And I go on to work because I did not want to depend on a God or anything else. I wanted to be this rugged individualist. And so, for a whole year, I did that. I would, I would, I would say my my mantra. I'd go to work, and on my lunch hour, I'd, I'd exercise, and uh, things were going good. And after a year of doing this, I heard I, I, this little voice started coming in saying, "Are you going to do this forever?" And I didn't pay any attention to it until probably about a month later. I was invited to a party. And it was a party where these people had arrived. These were all people that had come in. Bart had not too long ago come into existence. And these people had gotten jobs with Bart and gotten promotions and stuff. And they were celebrating. And uh, I felt a little, little like ease. You know, I, I knew I wasn't going to drink. I told the hostess who had this strapless dress on, and, you know, and sw swaying around the room that, you know, I know I didn't want any wine. But I felt like, you know, these guys got a little bit more going for me than, than I had. When I was drinking, I used to drink with lesser fellows, people that didn't make as much money as me. And I could buy them drinks and they would look up to me. But here, these were people that, that I was looking up to and I really felt ill at ease. And so uh, after the hostess uh, came up to me the third time, I decided, what the heck, I'll have a drink. I took that glass of wine, drank it down, and it went like, oh, it was so awful. Like, man, what? Oh, this is terrible. Give me another one. The second one wasn't that bad. And the third one, 
I'm chasing the hostess. Hey, what's going on? Let's party. Let's have a good time. This from I went from where they're having piano music, everybody's having a good time to I want to turn it up. Let's let's put something on. Let's 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 party. And about eleven o'clock, they they asked me to leave. You know, and uh, I remember going, leaving off the this the mountain, going down the hill, and I stopped at a Seven Eleven, and I got six pack of beer because I decided I'm never going to hang again like that. I'm not going to try it no more. Year, I'm just going to drink and enjoy myself and maybe die of cirrhosis of the liver like some of my relatives. But what the heck, I wasn't going to try to fight this anymore. But lo and behold, you know, waking up that next morning, uh, those hangovers and those, those, those that, that, that mental anguish, it's like, man, like all that stuff came back. That, that, that reason I'd stopped for the year, all those reasons came back big time. <laughs> And within two weeks, I couldn't, I, I, I was, I was spent, I was through. And this guy walked up to me when I was in my low, in my depths. And he said that, hey, you don't have to live like that anymore. It was at work. He said, you don't, you come into work smelling like a brewery. He said, you, you can go to AA and your life will change. And I was scared to death. I was I was in bad shape. I was, and I looked at that guy and said, "I'm not that bad." But a day or so later, I tried to drink and I couldn't. And I went to AA. And I went in there, I was scared to death. I, I didn't know what to expect. I had never been to an AA before, so I, I, I dressed the best I could. I put on a. Uh, and this was this, this was 1981. I put on a this was a psychedelic gauge, whatever. I had a butterfly collar, Jerry curl, bell bottom pants, uh, platform shoes, and I went in there like I was going to a club or something like that, or that I was going to be one of the star attractions. And people in there were looking much worse than me as, as far as wear was concerned, but. What I was impressed was with their honesty, their clear eyes, the fact that they weren't trying to sell me anything. They were just looking me right in the eye and telling me, hey, we have an answer for you. And there was a woman sitting up there at the table. And uh, she was about five foot two, 120 pounds. And she was telling the story that that had my, my had me on air. She she talked about how she would start drinking and leave her family, her husband and her kids, and go wherever the bottle took her. And when she got sober, she'd come back home and her husband would beat her, just beat her to inch of her life. She'd recover and do it again. She did this repeatedly. And I thought, if I had to live like that, I would have killed myself. I wouldn't have, no way. But this woman was smiling as she told this story. And I thought, man, as soon as the meeting was over, I ran up to her and I go, how do you do it? How, how can you do that? How, how do you do this? And she gave me the answer. She said, one day at a time. I thought, my God, one day at a time. What a concept. Because I had said, I quit forever. Forever. I'm never going to drink again. And that lasted me two days. Two days at best. Two days. But one day at a time, wow, one day at a time. I think I could do that. And I settled back and I took it easy. And all of a sudden, one day at a time, things started to change. The family, I wasn't upset when I got home, irritated, whatever. People, everything was in place because I kind of stepped back. My life took off. It really did. It, it got got real good. And I remember getting to step three, you know, made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood him and understood him, right? And my spiritual awakening was the form of my grandmother. And it was like, God, you know, why did you give me such a dirty deal. You took my mother, my grandmother, you know, I, life has been tough. 
and her, I could hear it in her voice saying, it could have been you. Now you have a chance to live a life I would be proud of. I thought, wow, okay. I could understand that. Because there were many times I could have killed myself. You know, just think about the times I drove drunk. I don't know about you, but the times I drove drunk and I would brag about how my car had a mind of its own, things of that nature. And I've been in meetings and I've heard people that weren't that fortunate. They've killed somebody. Some, I, I, I was in a meeting with a guy, I talked about he killed his child while drunk and in a wreck. But for the grace of God, I didn't have that experience, but it could have been me. And that was the thing that I really gravitated towards. A guy said it, said during the depths of his drinking, during the depths of his alcoholism, he was capable of anything. The reason he didn't make headlines is because the opportunity didn't present themselves. And then to get here and, you know, and, and find that there was a safe haven, it was like, oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. One day at a time, I'll do this, you know. And with that, my life took off. And then I uh, looked up. I had 11 years, Christina. Now the cloud on the horizon. I knew I knew the AA lingo. I knew I knew the ins and outs. I knew the players and the, the, the phonies or whatever else. I was comfortable in AA. Made my meetings. I remember I went home one Saturday and on the door, on my door was a note that said, your son has been shot. He's in John Muir Trauma Hospital. 11 years in the program. And I rushed there praying. Oh God, let him live. Let him live. I get there and they say, your son will live, but he'll be paralyzed for the rest of his life. And I thought, oh, you know. Why, you know, how could this happen to me? You know, you know, is there God, you know, you know, I got 11 years, you're going to put me in a position like this. And uh, finally, you know, I, uh, I, I was so upset. I stopped going to my home group. I would go to meetings. I still went to meetings, but I went to meetings in different places. Like if I had known about this place, I probably came here, North Oakland, but I went to Alameda to meetings. And I was in a meeting one one evening, and this guy, I never have seen him since. He had a beard like Dean and white hair, and he looked like he had about 30 days, so he was kind of shaky. And uh, he told me, he said, hey, you're just going through a phase. You're in a grief phase now, but just keep doing what you're doing, because no matter what anybody says, you can't grasp it. It's like you're insane, but just keep keep going to meetings. You'll be okay. I've never seen that man since, but that was the thing that saved my life. I didn't want to hear anybody tell me to keep coming. It's going to be all right. I probably punched him in the mouth. But this guy that didn't know me from Adam, I didn't know him, was able to tell me what I needed to know in an AA meeting. And uh, with that, you know, I started to to accept things. And I remember one day uh, coming out of this, the doctor, we were viewing my son's case and the chart where he had been shot, he had been shot multiple times. And the reality was it was a miracle that he was alive, you know. And today my son is with me. He's about two two doors down. He's, uh, he has a caregiver. He has several. And uh, I'm gr truly grateful, you know. Uh, it's like uh, a guy said also that when things go bad, don't go with them. You know, and that's the first, your first thought, you know, God, you let me down. So what are you going to do? Well, I should get a drink. I should show you. Well, no, I uh, stuck around and, you know, life showed up. And uh, today we take it a day at a time. And uh, my son has a caregiver, you know, and uh, I have a program. And uh, I, I find that this is the best life I've uh, I could, I could, you know, life shows up, you know, what, what am I going to do? You know, the script is there. And, and, and I've looked around and there've been other people in the program that had much worse situations than me. They've lost loved ones, you know, they've lost young children, whatever. And so, uh, I'm learning, you know, that, uh, this is the big one too, is that, uh, this is not our home. 
you know, this is this is not the end all. This is not the everything. There, there, perhaps there's something else down the road. You know, maybe there's a after this, there's another another existence of some type. And so, uh, with that, I just take it a day at a time and 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 great and try to try to make the most of it. And I find that being sober, I can do that. Like a guy said. Uh, uh, my 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 worst day in sobriety is better than any day I had drink, and that's true. How much time do I have left? You've got about ten minutes left. Probably, I'm probably going. I'm probably going to come short, but I'll tell you another that's one. Fine. When I was, uh, I had, uh, I was turning six. I turned sixty, and, and, and two friends of mine. We decided that we were going to uh, take a trip, and we had a friend uh, that had a kind of like an AA recovery thing in in, in uh, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and we decided we'd go there. And this guy showed us a lot time of a life. It was great. Really a great time, you know. And I thought, wow, you know, like the beaches, the the, the the different shows, the different restaurants, you know, and it was just the weather, it was just, it was perfect. And 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 three of us, we were all in the program. And so what uh I think about the fourth day we decided to go up to that Christ Mountain, you know, you've probably seen, you know, the picture that you know, looking down over Rio's this big statue of Christ and spread out. And I get up there with this statue looming over me. It's kind of smoggy, foggy. And I start thinking about my fellowship. I said, I'm feeling homesick. I'm uh, being in paradise, I realize that I have to be grounded in AA. That's 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 my life. That's what that's what really, really, really counts. I mean, that's that's where it's at. And uh it allows me to do things like that, but it's I can't I can't disconnect. You know, this is this is this is where I'm grounded at NA, and this is this is where I want to be, you know. This is what's saving my life. And so uh that's about all I have. I would uh, go on further, but uh next time. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.